Night Sweat by Robert Lowell is a poem about writer's block and depression. It's also about the creative imperative, the will to write. And furthermore, it considers how we often rely on the people we love to support us and keep us going. Night Sweat is a very revealing poem and can be described as a confessional poem. If you confess, you admit or acknowledge something, and you may have heard of the confessional in the Catholic religion, where you would confess your sins to a priest in an effort to receive forgiveness or absolution. As this poem exposes autobiographical truths, some awareness of Lowell's personal life is helpful to our understanding of it. So Robert Lowell, 1917 to 1977, was a celebrated American poet who achieved the Pulitzer Prize very early on in his career. He was from a very well-connected family, a friend to the famous poet Ford Maddox Ford and tutor to the brilliant Sylvia Plath. She is another poet and novelist that you may have heard of who also suffered from depression. Lowell's personal life was pretty complicated. He had three failed marriages. The first was to the writer Jean Stafford, the next to the novelist Elizabeth Hardwick, pictured here, who is almost certainly the dear heart of the poem Night Sweat. And then in 1970 he moved to England, where he met and married Lady Caroline Blackwood. Elizabeth was devastated and wrote Lowell many impassioned letters, which, to add insult to injury, he lifted lines from to use in his poetry. Lowell later left his third wife and the young son and made his way back to Elizabeth in America, who had, after all, been his wife and intellectual equal for 23 years, but he died of a heart attack shortly after arriving on American shores. As well as women, Lowell was interested in politics and religion. He served a prison sentence for refusing to be drafted, called up, in 1943, and he also protested against the Vietnam War in the 60s. Lowell became a Catholic as an adult, but abandoned his faith about the same time as he abandoned his first wife in 1948. Throughout his life, he suffered from manic depression. Considered a brilliant but difficult child, he saw a psychiatrist from an early age. He would have been well aware of the work of the famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. I'll read the poem now, but you can skip over this bit if you've read it recently. Work table, litter, books and standing lamp. Plain things, my stored equipment, the old broom, but I am living in a tidied room. For ten nights now I felt the creeping damp float over my pyjamas wilted white. Sweet salt embalms me and my head is wet. Everything streams and tells me this is right. My life's fever is soaking in night sweat. One life, one writing. But the downward glide and bias of existing wrings us dry. Always inside me is the child who died. Always inside me is his will to die. One universe, one body. In this urn, the animal night sweats of the spirit burn. Behind me, you, again I feel the light lighten my leaded eyelids, while the grey-skulled horses whinny for the soot of night. I dabble in the dapple of the day, a heap of wet clothes see me shivering. I see my flesh and bedding washed with light, my child exploding into dynamite, my wife. Your lightness alters everything and tears the black web from the spider's sack as your heart hops and flutters like a hare. Poor turtle tortoise, if I cannot clear the surface of these troubled waters here, absolve me, help me, dear heart, as you bear this world's dead weight and cycle on your back. Firstly, the title Night Sweat brings to mind a fever and has connotations of illness. The illness in this poem is anxiety and depression, but we also talk of approaching work in a fevered manner or sweating away at something to indicate that we're working hard. Indeed, this poem is about both the poet's work, his feverish creativity, and his poor mental health. We start with a list of ordinary things, the paraphernalia of a workspace or office, or the plain practical objects of a writer's life. Yet they are referred to as my stalled equipment, and this is the first indication of writer's block, that he has put down his tools, pen and paper, and cannot work. Stored equipment is a metaphor for his faculties letting him down as he slides into depression. At the end of the second line, we have a dash, and this punctuation creates a pause to further reinforce the idea of a break in his creativity. 
The third line begins with the conjunction, but, and whilst the poetic voice may be visualising the creative chaos of his workspace with drafts of poetry, litter on the floor, the reality is that his room is tidied and sterile and devoid of creativity. In fact, that has been the case for 10 nights now. Note the consonants here and the monosyllabic diction choices, which create a tone of annoyance and frustration. And rising panic is shown through the extended metaphor of sweating. <clears throat> that sweat is personified as creeping, and he feels it float over his pyjamas like a ghost. There are many words associated with water in this poem. Float, wet, streams, washed, troubled waters, etc. We can call this a semantic field of water or a lexical field, and it creates a sense of the speaker being overwhelmed or drowning in anxiety. Furthermore, his pyjamas are wilted white. This alliterative image has connotations of death, as flowers wilt when they are dying, and white is a pale, sterile, deathly colour. There are numerous other words associated with death in the first part of the poem. For instance, embalm, urn, body. If you embalm a body or a corpse, you preserve it from decay, originally with spices, but nowadays usually by the injecting of a preservative. Instead of spices, the narrator is embalmed in sweet salt. There are several interesting things to notice about this phrase. It's oxymoronic. Those two tastes are usually quite distinctive in nature, either salty or sweet. It's sibilant, sweet salt embalms, and this creates a sickly or unpleasant effect. Sweet sounds very similar to sweat and almost echoes it, reinforcing this horrible cloying image of the narrator in his panicked and febrile state. Yet everything tells me this is right. Rather than resenting this horrible state of panic, there seems to be an acceptance that it's part of the creative process. My life's fever is soaking in night sweat, i.e. this is what I was designed to do, this is my work. There is a sense, however, that life, everyday life, gets in the way of work and can create a downward glide, meaning a decline of or depression. The child who died, referred to in line 11, references his inner child. This is the childish, fun, hopeful and creative side of our personality. In the latter part of the poem, this image becomes explosive and bright, my child exploding into dynamite, showing a revival of his creativity with the support of his wife. But at the beginning of the poem, the child image becomes even more negative. In the next line, the will to die is referred to, and this could reference the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud's idea of the death drive, the idea that from birth we are dying and that we can often operate in a relentlessly self-destructive manner. And this is reinforced by the anaphora here too. There's a sense of religious devotion to his work. I think this is reinforced by the numerous echoes of biblical language or words from the Holy Communion service. For instance, the syntactic parallelism in one life, one writing has echoes of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. And also the breaking of the bread in the communion service, where the vicar would say, though we are many, we are one body, which reminds me of the one universe, one body line in the poem. This religious language and structuring creates a sense of writing being an essential part of the narrator's life that he's totally committed or devoted to. And here at the Volta, the turning point in the poem, the poetic voice commands behind me in a sharp exclamatory statement. This for a contemporary audience who would know their Bible might bring to mind the phrase get behind me Satan from the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus rejects the devil. So when Lowell uses this in the poem, it indicates that he's able to push away the devil of his depression and reach for something higher than human concerns, i.e. his art, poetry. He does this through the aid of his loved one, dear heart. Of course, it could also simply reference his wife standing behind him at his desk and backing him, supporting him. Looking at other religious references, which I've highlighted in green, we have the phrase troubled water. The idea of clearing the surface of the water has connotations of him trying not to drown in depression, getting his head above water. And it's an interesting metaphor reinforced by the plea, help me. But this phrase, troubled water, could also allude to the Gospel of John, where troubled waters referred to waters that were stirred or agitated by an angel and used to cure people. 
This is interesting as it clearly links to the idea that he's trying to get over his depression and get better with his wife's help. The use of light and dark imagery also links with the idea of religion. In the Bible, Christ is presented as the light, the saviour of man, and light imagery in literature often alludes to hope or Christianity. When Elizabeth is introduced to the poem as you in the second person pronoun direct address, the poetic voice feels the light lighten and we have a quick succession of lilting L alliteration, so different in tone from the sickly sibilance of that first sonnet. The narrator is washed with light or cleansed and her lightness alters everything. This lightness contrasts with the grey skulled horses, the dark nightmares that gallop through his mind and the lovely assonant and alliterative moment where he dabbles in the dapple of the day indicates the poetic voice surfacing from darkness into dappled light, a metaphor for him throwing off depression with his wife's help. We call this strong contrasting of light and shade chiaroscuro and it's a very clever way of illustrating manic depression where one can swing between energy and light, darkness and depression very quickly. Following this, Lowell uses zoomorphism to show how he and his wife operate. His thoughts are described as being a black web from the spider's sack. This presents them as dark and tangled and complicated. His wife is clearly more positive and her heart is compared to a fast and elegant hair in the simile, your heart hops and flutters like a hair. Note the breathy H alliteration, which creates a sense of being awestruck. In the very next line, the noun tortoise is mentioned. And you may remember the Aesop's fable of how the tortoise and the hare race against each other. So the tortoise is slow and steady and wins the race. It's interesting juxtaposition. Perhaps it indicates that she is everything to him, providing both the energy, the hair, and the steadiness, the tortoise. The turtle tortoise image also alludes to the myth of the wild tortoise, which is common in many cultures, including the indigenous American Indian one. In the myth, the tortoise with its hard shell supports the world on its back, a bit like Atlas in the Greek myth. So we have an image of dear heart carrying the weight of the world, supporting her husband. In the final line, this weight seems overwhelming as she is cycling on her back as if she's an upturned tortoise with its legs flailing. Yet she bears this weight, even though it's too much, and the poetic voice asks for forgiveness. Absolve me. So in summary, the poem shows how the poetic voice experiences writer's block. And whilst he realises it's all part of the process of being a writer, it causes him anxiety and depression. He's aware of how much his wife supports him and lightens his black mood, but he's conscious that it cannot be easy to live with a depressive person, as his writing involves sacrifice and suffering on her part too. Very quickly, I'll mention the form of the poem, which is also quite interesting because it's all 128 line stanza. But in terms of structure and rhyme scheme, if you look at it closely, it seems to be two 14 line poems, sonnets, put together. The first part takes the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. If you look at the end of each poetry line, you'll notice there's a distinctive rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then the rhyming couplet at the end. The second part of the poem seems to be a Petrarchan sonnet, although there's a slight deviation from the usual rhyme scheme of a Petrarchan sonnet. But what's interesting about this is that sonnets tend to be about love, usually romantic love. Um, not always, for instance, Ozymandias is about self-love or hubris or pride, but often it's about romantic love. And the first part of Flower's poem focuses on love for his art, the writing of his poetry. And the second part of this poem, the second sonnet, focuses on love for his wife. The main themes of this poem are creativity, self-doubt, depression and anxiety, love and relationships, marriage and the sacrifice that sometimes comes with marriage. I hope you found this video useful. Please take a moment to hit the thumbs up and thank you so much for listening.